times were bad. On that, everyone could agree. Everyone had different reasons why things were bad. They told different stories about what had gone wrong. They even pointed at different stuff when they said, this is what is awful. But everyone could agree on this much. Times were bad. In those days, most people survived by farming the land or fishing the lakes and seas. But the folks who farmed kept losing their land, falling deeper into debt and getting it reclaimed by the rich landowners. And as for the fishing families, well, the king of the time, Herod, he turned the lake into a commercial fishing enterprise and shipped the fish to Rome. And so there were fewer and fewer fish in the sea to survive on. All of the people who were hopeless, all the people who were sick, they flooded to the urban areas. And they didn't receive a warm welcome. In fact, they were treated so coldly it makes some insurance companies look like Mr. Rogers. Then, of course, there was Rome. Rome, who put the awful King Herod on the throne. Rome, whose armed soldiers occupied the land. Rome, whose, whose famed peace, the Pax Romana, was the excuse to conquer, to exploit, to execute people who stood up against them. Even though on paper the land was richer and more peaceful than ever, a handful of people were doing great while everyone else was struggling to get by. Even the land and the lakes were turning sour, it, it sounds a little familiar. And in this dark, hopeless time, a man appeared in the wilderness. He was the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, a well-known family, but he didn't seem quite right. If he were around today, he'd be hanging out far away from downtown, well outside the perimeter, in some wild field down by a flowing lake. He'd be wearing a, a tattered and torn hoodie and two pairs of pants to keep from the cold. He'd be eating old Twinkies and potato chips past their expiration date. And this man, let's call him John, out there in the wilderness, he preached. And he preached repentance and judgment and hellfire. He preached repentance enough that he would have made the worst of the old Baptist preachers jealous. But most of all, most of all, John pointed. He pointed to someone who was coming, someone greater than he is, who is yet to arrive, the Messiah, the Christ, the, the king who would, who would sweep in and, and chop off the heads of all the evildoers and toss King Herod out in the cold and drive the Roman occupiers out and make those, those famed Roman legions wail like toddlers who didn't get what they wanted. So when Jesus approached, John was expecting him. And at first, John was convinced, absolutely convinced, that Jesus was the promised king. But let's fast forward a few months. Suddenly, John's not so sure. And two big things have happened in the meantime. First of all, John got himself locked up in jail. He had been bashing King Herod, Rightfully so. I mean, Herod had married his niece, who was also his brother's wife. Not a strong move. And uh, Herod had been coming under some fire from John for this. And, and stop me if this sounds crazy, but people don't tend to love it when you criticize them. Especially not kings, when they're under fire from a prophet. So John, like prophets before and since, ended up in jail. And he's sitting there and he's thinking... Now would be a pretty good time for the revolution to start. He's getting a little impatient and thinking, how about a, a jailbreak now, please, maybe? The second thing that happened in the intervening time is that Jesus had started his work. And to be honest, if you're John, 
Jesus' ministry was a little bit of a bummer. I mean, Jesus built a mass movement, but he didn't seem to be getting ready to march on Rome. And, and he kept declaring the kingdom of God was here, but Herod is still hanging out on the throne. Jesus is, is promising peace instead of imposing punishment. And instead of delivering vengeance, he's talking about all this wimpy liberal stuff like loving your enemies and turning the other cheek. Jesus isn't condemning people. He's judging systems and curing people. It looked a lot different than what John was expecting, and he was running out of time. So he tells his disciples, you know, go ask this joker what he's up to. And, and John's disciples wander over to Jesus, and they ask Jesus, are you the one to come? And they hope he'll get the message, and the war on Rome will commence. And at this moment, and this is beautiful, Jesus could do so many things. He could have scolded John for his doubt. He could have said, you used to believe in me. What is wrong with you? But he doesn't. In fact, a few minutes later, Jesus is going to go on to just brag about how great John is to everybody. Even, even if John is doubting Jesus, Jesus never doubts John. Jesus never doubts for a moment that John has a role to play in God's plan for the world. And, and John's not alone in doubting. I suspect all of us have asked a hard question or, or wondered what it means to walk this path we call Christianity. But even if we have doubts about Jesus, Jesus never has doubts about us. Jesus is still just as convinced that you, that we, have a part to play in God's plan for this world. Now, Jesus could have done something else. He also could have told those thousands of people around him to grab the pitchforks. It's time for war. Time to uh, head out and fight like it's the last scene in an Avengers movie. Doesn't do that either. Instead, Jesus turns to the disciples of John and he says... The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the wretched of the earth learn that God is on their side. Instead of show and tell, like in grade school, this is show, don't tell. Don't tell them how great you are, show them what you're doing. Let your actions do the talking. Jesus isn't just listing his accomplishments, he's not just bragging on himself, he's, he's referencing specific promises that God made to the people of Israel. He's citing the words of Isaiah, his favorite prophet. And Jesus quotes Isaiah all the time, but Jesus always quotes Isaiah selectively. He, he quotes Isaiah and then he stops right at the verse about wrath and judgment. He'll quote scripture right up to the angry verses and then leave off. He always includes deliverance for the oppressed. And he always excludes vengeance against the oppressors. See, I think Jesus knows something that John forgot. Something that we all forget. The worst violence is almost always done in the name of peace. We tend to think violence and peace are polar opposites. We tend to think there's either violence or there's peace. But that, that hasn't been the case in most of human history. It's not the case in most families. The worst violence, the worst wrongdoing is almost always in the name of keeping the peace. We spend a trillion dollars on armies. We stockpile nuclear weapons in the name of peace. We impose the death penalty in the name of peace. We permit police violence in the name of peace. We leave LGBTQ kids out on the streets in the name of peace. We send refugees back to die in the name of peace. 
We inflict violent poverty or damage on climate because we don't want to risk the violent revolution that we think might be the only other alternative. And in our personal lives, we stay in relationships even after they turn awful. We decide not to stick up for ourselves to someone in our family or to our boss because we want to keep the peace. We shove our pain deep down inside because we're terrified of having to deal with it. We do violence to our own souls in the name of getting through another day, another day that we pretend is full of peace. And so we we end up eating too much, or drinking too much, or watching too much TV, because it brings us a false sense of peace that covers up all the violence that's raging inside us. We will do awful things in the name of peace. But Jesus will not. Jesus would rather die an ugly, painful death on a cross. And so Jesus tells John's disciples the last thing they wanted to hear. And then Jesus turns to all the people around and says, what did you expect to see out here? Did you expect to see a a reed blowing in the wind? And so at this time, Herod, the king, he would print coins that actually had an image of a reed blowing in the wind on it. So when Jesus talks about a reed blowing in the wind, when he talks about soft robes, he's saying, what did you come out to expect? A king who'd make you rich? Were you expecting a king who'd be a little bit better because all of his ugliness would be on your enemies and not on you? Or were you looking for a prophet? If so, you found the right place, Jesus says, because John is the greatest prophet in the history of prophets. But in this In this new revolution that Jesus is starting, John's the least of all. John's heart is in the right place. He wants all of the right things, but he wants them so badly that he and Herod become two sides of the same coin. He expects accusation and ugliness to drive out all of the stuff that accusation and ugliness created in the first place. He expects, to paraphrase Audre Lorde, to dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. And for John, the revolution advances violently. But for Jesus, the revolution, the true revolution, is always suffering violence. So what is, what is John pointing at? What is John pointing at out there in the wilderness? Well more than he even realizes, more than he can even imagine. And that's what we're waiting for this Advent. We're waiting for for God to break into our lives and heal the sickness in the world. We remember that love has already triumphed over cruelty. We're preparing our hearts for a revolution. And in this revolution, in the words of Isaiah, the lamb and the wolf live together in harmony. Jesus didn't come so that the lamb can finally have its revenge on the wolf. The dream of God, yes, it's that the lamb is free from oppression, but not free to go kill, free to truly love. And and in the beloved community that, that God wants to instill, the wolf is free too. Because what what God knows is that any act of violence tears us up inside. Whether it's what we say, or what we do, or what we don't do, or what we let other people do in our name. It rebounds on us, and it shatters a piece of our soul, like dropping your phone and watching it crack. It makes us scream out and, and try to find somebody to blame. And so... In this revolution, Jesus is here to set everyone free, free to love. Times were bad. On that, everyone could agree, and on that, well, lots of people can still agree. 
The world is still too full of suffering. There are too many tears. There's too much shouting and too many fists raised in anger. But in these bad times, Jesus is approaching. God is always still coming into the world. The fog may last a night, but joy comes in the morning. Jesus arrives in the darkness to do something deep and astonishing. He's he's knitting back together all those loose strands of the blanket of creation. He's putting back in tune that song that's been singing from the beginning of the age. He's smoothing out all those places that we made rough, and he's lifting up valleys. He's throwing off shackles that bind people. And he's willing to do it even if Rome, even if Herod, even if the mob, even if all of us react violently to him and stick him up on a cross. That won't stop God's revolution. Last Sunday we sang the old hymn, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. I love this hymn. The lyrics are based on a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. A poem that that I think captures Christ's incomprehensible, unexpected dream of peace. Today, it's still relevant because we still walk through stores today and we, we hear old, familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then we get home and we turn on the TV. We check the news. And the guns are firing, and the forests are burning, people are weeping. And with that sound, the carols drown. Now of peace on earth, goodwill toward men, and in despair, we bow our heads. There is no peace on earth, we said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And in In those moments, those darkest moments, that's when we remember what John was really pointing at. Not just a king, but a God. Not a new regime, but a renewal of all creation. Not punishment, but healing for all who cry out. Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth God sleep. The wrong shall fall, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill 